Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Martin Center Research Seminar. The seminar is hosted and supported by the Martin Center for Architectural and Urban Studies, the research arm of the University of Cambridge Department of Architecture. Today, we are delighted to welcome Daniel, an artist, writer, and historian, who, um, who will be talking about the <coughs> of the invisible epidemics and the city in theory and practice. And um, also joining us today is Dr. Nicholas Simchik Arese, who is a university lecturer at, um, at our University of Cambridge. Um, thank you both for joining us today. So we'll begin by um, with a presentation. It will last about 25 minutes, and this will be followed by a Q&A session. So same as before, you can type in your questions in the Q&A here on the webinar, or you, you could virtually raise your hands by clicking the blue hand emoji at the bottom of your screens. Um, and if you are watching us from Facebook, you can type in your comments, and then our conveners will help to transfer them to the webinar. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to Nick, who will introduce Daniel. So over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Nacha, and to the entire Martin Seminar team for convening this. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Daniel Yat, who is a Lebanese-American artist and a writer based in Paris and New York City. Uh, his work analyzes the political aesthetics of the everyday and the interdependence of cleanliness, order, and beauty in contemporary culture. He's written on and made art on the history of infrastructure, sewage technology, the development of public toilet networks, the place of agricultural hinterland in the social imagination, and the value of waste in contemporary art practice. Daniel taught in the Humanities and Media Studies program at the Pratt Institute School of Architecture, the Histories and Theories Studies Department at the Architectural Association, and co-founded the Architectural Association's Visiting School in uh, Linger in Norway. Gold master's degrees in histories of science and medicine from Oxford, art practice and science from Central St. Martin's, and histories and theories of architecture from the AA. He's also a good friend of mine uh, who is in Soho right now in the middle of um, very tumultuous times, um, kind of witnessing it all. So um, I understand he wasn't able to sleep much last night, but I'm sure his, his presentation will be um, brilliant. So without further ado, just introduce um, Daniel. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, so today we will be talking about um, the aesthetics of the invisible um, and its relationship, uh, the relationship between um, aesthetics and uh, the city. Um, so um, just to introduce uh, my practice, which we'll talk about later, as well as what we're going to talk about in, during this discussion, um, broadly we're going to respond to uh, um, a paradigm that was described by Sigmund Freud in Civilization and its Discontents, where he describes the kind of preconditions for any civilization to be cleanliness, order, and beauty. So cleanliness um, seems pretty straightforward to us nowadays, um, but we'll go through the history a little bit. We'll be focusing particularly on cholera and tuberculosis. Um, and secondly, order um, is uh, quite explicitly um, the domain of the political. Um, and beauty is something uh, that we should think about in terms of aesthetics um, more than the romantic idea of beauty. Um, but it, it, we'll be looking at, at how this um, idea of beauty is, is uh, indispensable to the other two forms of the social. Um, so we'll be looking at the aesthetic domain of the social and of course at the aesthetic domain of the political as well. Um, the first thing I want to note is that um, it is not possible to directly conflate uh, different epidemics. Um, uh, this is a CNN headline from just yesterday, which is nonsense, and we will not be doing this. Um, even the maths is nonsense. Um, but um, I want to just uh, um, underline the point that every pathogen has its own agenda and that each pathogen exists within a distinct socio-political condition. And so if anything, um, comparisons, comparisons should be made through the social political aspect and not through the actual epidemic uh, pathogen that's become an epidemic. So I really just wanna underline that point and get it out of the way. Um, uh, there are, however, um, different definitions of disease that we can compare. 
um, because uh, disease is kind of like the reaction to the pathogen itself. But we'll be looking at those um, throughout. Um, I'll first start talking about cholera and the outbreak of cholera. Um, the first known outbreak was in 1817 near Calcutta and in present day India um, and Bangladesh. Um, and that, that uh, uh, epidemic spread as far as the Middle East um, uh, and the, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so people in, um, in Western Europe were definitely aware of it. Um, people in China were definitely aware of it. Um, there was a kind of anxiety that was growing about the, the sort of progression of this, um, of this disease. Um, sure enough, uh, the second pandemic hit Russia first and then sort of uh, quite quickly spread um, uh, into Western Europe um, and particularly hit uh, um, Paris and London quite badly. Um, cholera is uh, an interesting disease um, because it corresponds um, to a shift from an embodied metaphor understand metaphorical understanding of the body politic um, into uh, more of a socialized idea of a body where the body is not necessarily literal, but there's um, a theory of organization that underpins uh, this kind of model of what society is. And the word organization literally comes from your organs in your body and how they're organized. Um, so this is the frontispiece to Leviathan, which is quite well known. Their sort of history of using um, these uh, kind of um, biblical, celestial, um, mythical imagery to represent society. Um, here, um, the Uruboros, the snake eating its own tail, is representing actually all of the cosmos. Um, um, but we see a direct correlation between uh, um, specific organs and like specific functions here within a house, but also within the city itself. Um, here we see a, a, a multi-headed um, threat coming in to sort of uh, threaten society. Um, interestingly, though, um, the, the, the theory of the body was not exactly formulated either. So um, there is some uh, um, wiggle room in the definition of, of what is organic and what is mechanical. Unfortunately, I can't get into that too um, too much because it's a whole another bag of worms. But this uh, is an image of some of the first anatomical um, studies, uh, uh, at least in the early modern era. Um, this is from the 17th century. And they were looking, it was um, uh, an anatomist called William uh, Harvey, who was looking at uh, how the blood flows around the body. So a big part of the circulation model um, that he, uh, well, that was developed from his work um, plays into organization as a social theory. Um, this idea of organization and the shift from the body politic to the social body and uh, a, a gradual uh, rationalization of the, um, of the built environment corresponds to what Michel Foucault has called the birth of the clinic. Um, so there's a rationalization of, um, of the way that disease interacts with the body as well as um, uh, a rationalization of how the, uh, the body and the city are related. Um, so this, ration, this rationalization can be summarized pretty well in terms of what Michel Foucault describes as um, a shift from uh, a physician asking you, what's the matter with you? To a physician asking you, where does it hurt? Um, because that was a way of uh, rationalizing uh, where the uh, infection was actually um, taking place. And they would record this information into a database, um, which became um, especially important because uh, at this time, the social, the social domain, what was defined as social, um, was increasingly being abstracted into data. And these data were um, beginning to form the basis of a political economy that was sort of corresponded to the, the, the social body. Um, even as um, the body is abstracted into data, into a numerical set of information, um, 
uh, it retains a highly organized corporal and embodied sense, um, mostly in terms of the circulation of, of, of um, blood, which was then transformed into the circulation of goods uh, in basically in early capitalism. Um, and it retains a highly um, functional idea of how the different parts of the body interact. So these are images of disease um, as uh, of, of a cholera, actually, when, um, when it first broke out in the 1830s. So here we see um, disease symptoms represented on the whole body. We see the disease itself personified um, here as death. Um, um, and here is some sort of frightening ghoulish um, model. Um, but then we see uh, at the same time a shift towards a more rational understanding of anatomy and especially of physiology, because the body was seen as a metaphor for um, uh, a sort of functioning system, a whole made of parts. Uh, likewise, we see um, the beginnings of um, changes in mapping. This is the Turgot plan from the 18th century. You may recognize it as the plan that the situationists cut apart. Um, and then this is the sort of development of the plan um, of, of the city of Paris, uh, showing all of its hospitals. And these are seen as different organs that formed a whole. So um, in, in terms of the data that was being produced about illness, about disease, and about other phenomena in the city, um, we can see the development of proto-statistical proto work. So not only are, um, not only are uh, data being collected, but they're being analyzed and used to project uh, certain uh, information or, 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 or models of how the city should be. Um, and these were uh, usually quite characteristically modern traits. Um, so Weber describes modernity as, first of all, the decline of magical thinking, um, but also the rise of capitalism, and thirdly, the rise of a bureaucratic and centralized state. Um, and that's really important to sanitary reform, both in the UK and in France. Um, the sanitary reformers were using statistics um, as a, a kind of early um, form of, of what was described by uh, of quite eminent French um, uh, uh, the physiologist um, as the numerical method. And this was paralleled as well by um, the core of engineers who were, um, who were um, also using the numerical method in their calculations of how to actually build the city. Um, and hygienists in France were actually usually made up of both uh, engineers and um, doctors, uh, as well as some members of industry. Um, but these were the early founders of medical statistics and of epidemiology. Um, in, in the UK, there was uh, Chadwick, who we'll get back to, um, and he wrote the sanitary report on the working conditions of the, um, of the poor in London. Um, uh, there was William Farr, whose um, uh, work we'll see in a minute, and um, there's famously as well uh, John Snow, who in 1854 removed the um, handle off a pump in Soho in London in order to uh, prove that cholera was waterborne and that there was an infected source. Um, in France, there were two main hygienists. Um, there was uh, Alexandre Farrand du Chablet, um, his statistics were kind of odd. He, he used a sort of sense-based uh, system um, that was based on, on seven. There was like seven scales that he would sort of um, empirically respond to. Um, whereas um, the second statistician, well, the second uh, hygienist, the statistician uh, Villarme, was more interested in um, looking at the mortality of Paris by analyzing the numbers um, that he didn't necessarily collect, but that were collected from the whole city and from the sort of hospital system that we uh, saw earlier. So he looked at, um, uh, at uh, statistical um, models, basically, and, and invented a lot, of, um, a lot of the epidemiological uh, processes that still exist today. 
Um, so these are the drawings of, of um, William Farr that I mentioned. He was actually educated in France and brought some of these techniques over to, um, to the UK. Uh, these are a little bit later from about 1840 to 1850. Um, and we can already see how um, medical knowledge is being abstracted. It's no longer a painting of uh, someone who's suffering um, from, um, from the disease, but rather it's a sort of quantifiable piece of information that you can then abstract and graph. Um, here, the light, light uh, shaded black represents the excess deaths that were um, occurring in London. And this is a graph that um, compares mortality and temperature. Uh, these are death rates in, uh, in the UK, also by William Farr. William Farr um, had an uh, exceedingly and an unusually beautiful um, uh, graphic style. Um, here's a, an interesting map uh, where he's kind of um, also uh, thrown in some um, personal judgments, I guess. So here it says harebrained court and overcrowding in what's now Bethnal Green. Actually, it was Bethnal Green then too. Um, but we can see um, the kind of development of a, of a graphic language. And this is uh, um, quite strongly represented in forms of graphs. Um, while most statistical data isn't as creative or as um, aesthetically interesting as this, um, most of it uh, comes out in the form of these endless graphs. Um, but what's um, important is, uh, especially in the work of Villermé, who I mentioned earlier, um, is that the, this was enforcing a, a social theory of disease. At the time, there were several different concepts about um, what, were, what was actually causing disease. Um, obviously, they hadn't invented germ theory yet. Um, they hadn't uh, developed the ability to uh, identify bacteria. Um, but um, there were th three basic uh, ideas. First of all is miasma theory, which was based on the idea that, um, that uh, um, essentially bad airs, uh, airs of putrefaction or of stagnant swampy water caused, um, caused disease. Secondly, that um, disease was uh, contagious, the contagion theory, and that was the idea that disease was spread from person to person. And thirdly, um, there was the social theory of disease, which basically held that poverty itself was causing disease. Um, and this is really important until the late 19th century and even into the early 20th century, as um, more methods for disease prevention were pro proposed by the state. Um, mainly this was, um, the development of sewer systems in response to cholera because it was waterborne. Um, but importantly, this was uh, indicative of the state becoming more responsible for, um, for uh, health care um, from a kind of top-down approach. So the development of sewer systems in France and the UK were um, still very much about circulation. But it was also about sociopolitical division of classes, an invention of the poor, a division of the poor from the working poor, um, and uh, about prophylaxis. Um, so giving uh, the poor the ability to kind of sanitize themselves and thereby giving them responsibility for their own disease. Um, Apart from the development of the sewers, um, this sort of centralization of health that was happening in, uh, the, um, in the state um, also uh, sort of elevated the numerical method, um, the abstraction of um, the disease and its effects that were happening on individual bodies into a collective whole, um, into statistical de data, um, and uh, using those uh, that information as part of the of the regulation of society by the state. Um, and this was as much about the sort of circulation of, um, of miasmas or contagion, um, but also um, about uh, the circulation of goods and about establishing norms mathematically, as well as deviations from that norm. Um, so uh, crime and health were um, quite, uh, strongly correlated um, 
through these kind of social models of disease study. Um, but um, uh, um, so too were health and wealth. The idea of uh, industry and industrial safety, obviously having workers who are fit for business, who are fit for um, industrial production is also quite important. This idea of the, uh, of the social disease carries over quite strongly into cholera, sorry, into tuberculosis. With tuberculosis, the idea of norms um, really become ingrained into uh, planning and design. Um, whereas cholera was managed or attempted to be managed through water provision and through water drainage, um, i.e. through sewerage, um, the, the intent there was to make the contagion invisible, um, to sort of uh, hide it away and put it underground and eject it from the city. Um, although there was some idea, there was some discussion about where the waste would actually go. Um, tuberculosis was actually far more concerned with the idea of, uh, of people suffering from it being put out into the open. So because the symptoms were kind of invisible, whereas with cholera, the sort of contagion um, occurs through um, diarrhea, that would have been obviously more visible than a cough or a sneeze or um, even just singing or speaking was able to, it was a, a means of spreading um, tuberculosis. Um, so uh, these are instances of cholera um, in, the, um, in the body, in specific parts of the body, after uh, Robert Koch had discovered the bacteria that caused tubercula uh, cholera. Robert Koch discovered the bacteria that cause both tuberculosis and cholera. So here we see the infected organ rather than the entire person and how they're sort of looking or feeling. And as well as the, um, the uh, microscope's view of, of the bacteria underneath. Um, here we see a range of possible symptoms. Here as well, this is a kidney that's been um, infected by uh, cholera and is uh, visible under the microscope as well. So we see a shift in how um, cholera is depicted. Um, these are instances of, of this kind of sanitary conditions that they thought were spreading disease um, in, 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 the, um, in the poorer areas of the city. So um, in terms of how uh, disease was dealt with in, um, in the 19th century and up until the 20th century, um, the, 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 the processes by which cholera and tuberculosis were um, uh, socialized and um, regulated was really an issue of putting them into place. Mary Douglas has, is an anthropologist who very famously um, talked about the sort of spatial system that exists within any given society. Um, and that there's a definition of dirt as, um, uh, as something that's dangerous or that's taboo and that doesn't fit into that place. Um, so matter out of place, moop. I really wanted to underscore this idea because it's quite important um, in terms of how disease is dealt with as opposed to a pathogen. So um, whereas sewage was taken away and made invisible, uh, tuberculosis was actually made more um, visible. Uh, in through the use of sanatoriums. Um, this is a page from Diderot's Encyclopedia, uh, and this is um, uh, Jay Forrester's uh, um, sort of diagram of the world, um, just to show you that there's a kind of system of putting things into place and that this idea of organization um, correlates directly to even modern forms of, of planning and understanding. This is from the 1960s, um, basic cybernetic model. Um, so from the mid 19th century, uh, um, sanatoriums were uh, being built in order to treat TB. Um, and as the city grew, so did uh, infections of tuberculosis. Um, so um, TB is interesting because it has a latent form um, which is very tricky to diagnose, um, and it can sort of activate at different times, but it um, can lay dormant in one system. Um, so uh, the, the pathology and the diagnosability is quite similar to COVID-19 in that way, in that there's a kind of invisible threat. Um, 
there is a new book by Beatrice Colomina released, uh, I think, a couple months ago called X-Ray Architecture, where she argues about the relationship between modern architecture in the 20th century and the transparencies implied by the, by the medical technology of visualizing um, what's invisible or not visible, um, i.e. what you can't see inside. So um, there was a whole host of, of medical visual technologies, such as, such as chromophotography, um, which were used in many different ways and are based actually in, in medical diagnoses that were happening in hospitals, mostly in France. Um, so um, I'm slightly more concerned uh, with um, a, a larger societal scale um, than Beatrice Palomina is because I feel like she's looking at the aesthetics of architecture specifically. And I'm actually interested in, in, in a more indirect or, or even like metaphorical interpretation of how disease impacts the social imagination. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really interested in after germ theory, um, when the visibility of TB and cholera becomes possible, how the city begins to shift. These are sewers in Paris at the end of the 19th century. So um, we start to see a kind of ra rationalization of urban form through material processes, um, even a rationalization of the world through understanding um, where disease is traveling from. Um, and um, I I'm really interested in, in the way that um, uh, disease is understood, manifested, and, and made uh, visible. Um, what's interesting about um, the 19th century uh, uh, social body or, or urban political corporal metaphor is, um, is that it's actually very hard to represent. And ironically enough, um, planners and designers and social thinkers at the time were quite aware of the fact that um, using this bodily metaphor was um, was um, a rhetoric device, rhetorical device, essentially, that had its own kind of limitations and that was reductive in its own way. Um, interestingly enough, these were not depicted um, through um, like visual interpretations, like through representative uh, bodies. But um, the, the primary means by which they were represented was the map, um, showing a sort of holistic understanding of the city that's been uh, reinterpreted as a whole, um, as a whole body, if you will. Um, but also through a, a new forms of novel. Um, this is from the late 19th century. Um, it's a book called Paris, Her Organs, Her Functions, and Her Life. Um, so here you see a very like biological, physiological, um, vitalist understanding of how the city functions. And the organs in question are like the post office, the morgue, um, cemeteries, sewers, electricity networks, things like that. Um, so uh, in terms of thinking about the um, uh, possible aesthetic changes that are happening as a result of COVID-19. Um, if we look at uh, tuberculosis and cholera, we can see that there's, they kind of correspond to a shift in, a, in, a, in an understanding of the aesthetics of, um, of the city as a whole, of urban planning. And uh, that's for cholera. And tuberculosis um, really codified the rationalization of architecture. This is an image of one of the first um, sanatoriums ever built for the treatment of, uh, of tuberculosis. Um, it was designed by Joseph Hoffman um, in the mid 1850s. And it is obviously quite a luxurious, um, but inherently medical um, uh, program in the building, uh, in the architecture. This is some sort of electric shock therapy that obviously didn't work. Um, so this is, uh, you know, quite a luxurious building. Um, it became um, the basis of both modern hospitals as well as modern um, sort of resorts in a way. If I could just point out here that there's a ping pong zimmer, a ping pong room, and a billiard zimmer. 
Um, so it was, it was as much about sort of resting one's, um, uh, you know, uh, mind as well as resting the body that was overcome by tuberculosis. Um, and of course, it was about exercising the body. Um, these are all things that we see recurring in, in modern architecture, especially in like, say, the architecture of Le Corbusier, where he wants to lift the building in order to have uh, sort of airflow. Um, you walk into the building, there's a sink there, there's different types of circulation, and of course on the roof garden you're supposed to go up and, and um, exercise your body and keep fit and, and strong. Um, but in, in a kind of, I mean it's both a top-down and a bottom-up approach to how the body should be managed and how illness should be managed. So um, in terms of COVID-19, um, I'm not going to make any outright predictions of how the city will be um, uh, will be changed in material form, but I think we'll see some political and some uh, aesthetic changes in terms of how we visualize um, the social domain. Um, one thing I think we'll see is this kind of two meter benchmark or six foot benchmark. Um, that will kind of create a sort of marker and measure for public space. Um, and we'll see the mass proliferation of sneeze guards. Um, actually, this two meter distance is basically a sneeze guard. It's determined by how far you can sneeze, um, which is, I think, a, a wonderfully kind of surreal form of, of measure for the city. Um, and um, masks as well. Masks are essentially sneeze guards. They, they protect from this sort of mouth outwards, not the other way around. Um, one thing to note is that uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, is a, is a virus um, and not a bacteria, whereas cholera and um, tuberculosis were, um, were bacterial diseases. Um, so we've kind of shifted back to a kind of uncertainty and a kind of risk calculation, both on a personal scale, but also on a governmental scale that these calculations are being made um, uh, and considered in a way that they haven't been before vaccination and antibiotics. Um, and of course, this is, this is a Google image search that I screenshotted of what coronavirus supposedly looks like. And it's, you know, there's these spiky ball renderings, um, sometimes pertaining vaguely to territory, but, um, you know, not explicitly. Um, and this is obviously not something we're going to see in our daily lives. This is a sort of mental image that's been given us, given to us um, by either electron microscopes or by uh, renderings based on electron microscopes. But basically, the, the, the spiky ball we fear. Um, so in terms of my own work, just to wrap up, I'm going to quickly go through um, some uh, situations that I've put together. Um, that respond to the idea of political aesthetics. Walter Benjamin separated the um, ideas of aesthetical politics and political aesthetics. Aesthetical politics he described as what fascist, fascist governments do, especially the Nazis and Mussolini's government um, during World War II or during the mid-century, um, whereas political aesthetics is about bringing uh, um, politics and everyday life into the, into, um, the domain of uh, aesthetical or art making. Um, this is an important distinction because, um, because it shows a sort of um, emancipatory potential for aesthetics and how we can harness that and put it into theory. Um, I try to look at, at um, ideas that are sort of lowercase p political and um, try to use uh, aspects of hygiene in order to um, describe uh, certain situations. So this is a project where I clean soil off of a bunch of root vegetables that I had bought at a market, and I sold them by weight um, uh, according to the, the total weight of the, um, of the box of root vegetables that I had bought. So I was selling these small vials of agriculturally productive soil um, that I had cleaned off the, um, uh, the vegetables in, in order to um, kind of create a, an emphasis on what type of um, economies we are participating in and how we can uh, 
um, aestheticize uh, the, the very daily interactions of uh, production and distribution that are created in the way we consume food. Um, here's me selling some, some uh, soil. Um, this is another project called Solarium, uh, which was a performance where I threw salt over my shoulder for um, several hours. Um, the idea here was that uh, I was taking um, salt from essentially the streets of the city, um, incorporating ideas of superstition, which are highly important to hygienic practices, and, um, uh, and using that um, as a way to critique my present situation as an artist due to the fact that um, uh, the word salary comes from the Latin word salt, because salt used to be used as a form of payment. Um, so it was kind of like a coy protest about the fact that artists aren't paid enough and also about my anxiety and ridding myself of bad luck. Um, finally, this is a, um, a sort of sculptural situation that I created in which uh, uh, several flags, tricolor flags, which are indicative of the Republic, were stuck into bases of ice, um, which as they melted, changed the symbolic value of the, um, of the uh, imagery of the flag. And this was both about the kind of uh, immediate environment, the heating, the, the, the um, uh, air conditioning that was available in the galleries, um, as well as uh, metaphorically um, about um, ice melting and climate change and the effect that that has on, on, on the power of the Republic. Um, so basically a, a sort of corporate Republic um, uh, tension. Um, and I see uh, uh, a lot of these issues um, becoming of uh, strong interest to us as we go forward in the city um, aware, of, aware of COVID-19. I think we're going to be hyper aware of, of hygiene and infrastructure, and we're going to be sort of putting those forward um, as an aesthetic, aesthetic device as, as well as obviously a functional device. So thank you very much. Um, that's, uh, uh, the main uh, presentation. Um, so, are we open for questions? Hi, can I? Is it time for me to tell me? So, thank you so much. I feel like um, there should be a round of applause, but it is a virtual full house of fifty people. So, we now have to kind of imagine a resounding room of uh, of applause <laughs> in in the absence of uh, physical proximity. But um, I'm sure. Uh, or I imagine people are, are very interested in what's happened and, and have questions. Um, but maybe before we jump into that, I don't know, just a couple of reflections of, um, I think your, your kind of astounding ability to jump between theory and practice. Um, and there's a lot that could be, could be kind of talked about from, from the more historical dimensions of this to the contemporary ones. And I think I'll focus maybe on some of the contemporary, let's say the, the, uh, the, the longitudinal, the kind of longitudinal uh, kind of evolutionary kind of component of this. But a first quick note is you, you, you showed that quick map of the, of the, of the Paris that the situationists had used. And it, so as a quick aside, um, your, your presentation kind of illuminated how, how, how radical of a response the situationists drawing works were really still today to carving yeah. up this kind of surgery of the city of this kind of organism it was also used to generate a kind of psychological and physical barricades. Um, again, very transformative and already starts to, to kind of flow into some of the questions I have for um, the contemporary situation, particularly in light of, of what's happening right now in America, the racialization of, of pandemic discourse, the racialization of the city, uh, police brutality, George Floyd, etc. So there's a, the main kind of kind of thing that your talk struck in me was around how and if some of these undergirding values and principles, the ideological kind of culturally hegemonic kind of principle of, of rationalization seems to be evolving or just merely accelerating. If there's a kind of jump or if it's just more of the same and it's more invisible. So in, 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 your, in your kind of bifocal theory practice efforts, seems to me that you're really witnessing and tracking what you so eloquently described as the aesthetics of the invisible. And so, you know, what I really wonder is if, um, if rationalization, this kind of highly subjective 
often criticized as very limited, a kind of economistic magic concept that's been used to bend the world over the last kind of two centuries, producing lots of good, but also perhaps lots of less good. If, if you think that that, ration, that value of rationalization is merely accelerating or evolving or leaping in other directions. So of course, I think of the smart city as a kind of AI organ uh, and of course a mode of representation and, and to me implicitly I see an acceleration of, of, of information rather than any kind of strong shift but I wonder what you think. I, I think of temperature and mortality and climate systems being used, uh, computer models on climate systems being used to model spaces today which so many of our, of our faculty and students are, are so interested in and how you know how those can at times not only be so useful for issues like climate change but also maybe uh, frame much more circumscribed possibilities for, for users. And I also think of, of monitoring of, of the disease today and, you know, some particularly kind of sinister, cynical recent readings of how, for example, contact tracing uh, will no longer work, especially in the U.S., because no one who's been involved in these protests would ever want to be put themselves on a, on a kind of database through an app. So I see the kind of the multi kind of hydra of how this is playing out today, and particularly as it as it kind of confluates with, um, with 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 protest. So, to go back to this issue of kind of the general question of social control and the rationalization of set space, and the question of whether you see an evolution, or change, or an acceleration, I think of of course pandemics and riots as both metaphors and instruments familiar tropes of social illness coming up, of the spread of, of anger as a kind of disease. And I also am reminded, because I've recently been reading a book called um, uh, The End of Policing by Alex Vitale, uh, the, the invention of policing also coincides with some of the, the inventions of kind of planning and pandemic maintenance. In the 1820s, colonial officials in Ireland were some of the first, were the first to invent the term policing. So, you know, we see a lot of these phenomena today. They, have, they track kind of together social control through both the city as an organ and, and policing, which somehow benefits from or, or, or works through the same logic. And, and the value that fundamentally undergirds these, as you rightfully point out, seems to be, I think, the ideology of, of rationalization of space in the city, which, which again, the situation has seemed to so, so powerfully kind of jam by, by doing something seemingly crazy and, and slicing up the city. So, you know, in your practice, I wonder if do you, how, how do you think of the kind of longitudinal progression of rationalization of a value? Do you see a change in that, especially as we enter a kind of a post, kind of potentially post neoliberal kind of Trumpian universe of, of post-truth and, and whatnot? So where, 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 where do you think the evolution of rationalization is going? Is it more of an evolution or more of a, of a leap in another direction, of course we can't know, but and how do you read it through architecture and planning? Um, I think we're at some, some somewhat of an impasse in a way, um, because um, probably these metaphorical models um, that we've inherited in these sort of piecemeal uh, abstracted forms um, are almost, uh, uh, I guess you could almost describe them as the kind of first um, first uh, iteration of the smart city in a way, because it was the first time that cities were able to be understood as a whole. Um, but the impasse we're at now is that actually medical advancements have changed disease, um, disease prevention and disease treatment um, in, uh, in huge ways. And, you know, um, the city will I mean, society will um, change once again, once we have kind of herd immunity to COVID-19, whether it's through natural um, and quite damaging processes or hopefully more likely through the uh, vaccine. Um, but um, what's interesting is that the, the medical advances have kind of changed the, the, the relationship we have to our own bodies and thus to this metaphor, which seems um, sort of outdated. Uh, I, one thing I wanted to underline, actually, is that um, like COVID-19, uh, cholera and tuberculosis are still active diseases. They haven't been cured in any way. There's currently a cholera outbreak in Haiti as well as in Yemen due to 
um, natural disasters or man-made disasters, i.e. like a bombing campaign by Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, but um, while, while sort of medical advances have gone forward, we've changed at least in sort of um, uh, uh, developed countries um, uh, or, or countries with a developed medical system, we've changed our understanding of, of how that social dimension exists. But what we have inherited is, is something you pointed out, which is the idea of like a social ill uh, or a social ailment. Um, uh, and interestingly, you mentioned police. Uh, the, pol the police initially used to be um, descriptions of certain sanitary laws that were used um, for the necessities of social control, usually during a pandemic. Um, so it, they weren't actually like people that, or a body of people. They were um, uh, laws. And the police force um, is, is actually what we refer to by the police now. It's a kind of shorthand. Um, so, I mean, we're stuck with uh, like stigmas and, and preconceptions about ideas of poverty and class inequality, uh, race, of course, which is a completely um, like medicalized idea, um, at least during the 19th century. It was invented uh, like alongside a lot of more viable ideas like Darwinism versus social Darwinism. Um, and these, these social ills are, um, are still with us in a way, I think. Um, we still look at a police force to be able to uh, control um, uh, what's seen as, um, you know, uh, behavior that isn't permitted or, or that behavior that is uh, antisocial, let's say, um, um, as opposed to the police who are seen as sort of representative of the social. Um, and, and like the idea of, of, of violence and pandemics uh, or at least epidemics um, corresponding is is not at all a new phenomenon. I mean, if you um, if you look up cholera riots, you'll see that they happen every ten years more or less, and they're almost always um, uh, uh, directed towards um, uh, institutions of authority, um, whether that's like uh, actual police or sanitary um, authorities. Uh, like a uh, hygiene police um, versus uh, you know more legal police, let's say, um, uh, or towards doctors themselves. Um, there was a, a, a riot in Liverpool that revolved around um, the idea that, uh, or like an anxiety about body snatchers. Um, they thought that people were being killed. Uh, and that the the cholera outbreak was a uh, pretense for um, gathering bodies to to donate to a local medical school for anatomy lessons. Um, so there's a there's a there's a consistent thread thread of 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 um, this kind of idea. And and so in terms of um, acceleration of of the idea of of this kind of social control um, model. Um, I think, first of all, it's worth mentioning how related organization theory is to systems theory and to cybernetics theory, which is seen as like this somehow like very cutting edge kind of um, way of thinking, um, but is, is not that different from, from sort of 19th century metaphorical modes of thought, but kind of without the, um, without the self-awareness or the irony. Um, but more, more than anything, I think we're, we're stuck in a moment um, we're stuck in, in, in a sort of uh, a consequence of this metaphor. We're stuck in the kind of idea of social ills. Um, and, you know, if we, if we think about what's happened this week alone, um, you know, you have, first of all, resistance to scientism and uh, resistance to uh, um, pandemic control, which should be completely uncontroversial in a way. Um, because like no one should be on the side of the virus. Um, and secondly, we have um, protest against uh, the overuse of force and authorities, um, which uh, like almost certainly feed back into each other. I mean, at least they are by the, by the graffiti I've been reading on my way to the supermarket, um, that there's a, a direct correlation between these ideas um, of, of social management needing a kind of 
new um, new evolutionary step. Um, and I guess evolution, like you said, is not um, is is never a, a very smooth process. You know, it, it jumps in in spurts, and usually, usually, um, if we we whoever that is, if we force it. Okay, thank you. Is there Nacha? Do we have? Um, yeah, sorry, we have have questions here. If you can, you see in the Q and A. There's some. Um, is it up here? Oh, is it on? Is it on Facebook or on Zoom? No, no, it's on the Q and A on the webinar. I can, it's from John Mooney. I'm on all panelists and attendees. It's on the bottom, the Q and A. I don't. Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, we have one question. So this is two. One from John Meunier, I believe it's pronounced. The Ville Radieuse of Le Corbusier clearly relates to your comments about tuberculosis. Does our situation warrant a reflection on that concept? The first um, one. Yeah, absolutely. I think I underplayed that um, simply because you should read Beatrice Colomina's book, um, which uh, explicitly goes through like every line that that Le Corbusier mentions about um, how how um, how like direct a response the Ville Radio uses to um, to tuberculosis, um, and it's basically taking the sanitarium model of air and light and and uh, sort of repose as much as exercise um, and transforming it uh, into the architecture and then the architecture onto the urban scale. Um, do we warrant a reflection on that? You know, it's one thing that I've really been craving since the beginning of this pandemic is a, is a balcony. Like my brother has a balcony and I'm like so jealous. Um, so, I mean, um, also just the idea of a, of a garden. Um, and, you know, some of, the, some of the public spaces we've been seeing occupied the most um, and, and now kind of like uh, circums or like overscribed with um, these bizarre um, like uh, six foot radius circles um, is public parks, right? Which are the quote unquote lungs of the city, um, which is a kind of strange correlation between a pulmonary or a mainly pulmonary disease and, and where people have ended up. Um, I mean, I, I think it'll, it'll certainly be uh, I mean, continued to be considered in, in the global south where, um, you know, sanitation and, and, uh, um, and overcrowding is, is an issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, not sh I'm not sure. Um, of course, in the, in the US, the alternative to the kind of build radios model, um, aside from the very limited social housing that they have, in urban centers here was the suburb. Um, so, you know, if you think about the development of the suburb um, and like the development of like the car as this kind of like personal property that was also mobile, um, you can sort of think about 20th century um, cities as developing um, this kind of space to breathe and roam um think of like la for instance it's it's a it's a city that's organized very differently than than um new york uh whereas new york had this early 19th century commissioner's plan to like rid out the whole city um into these like rational zones um without central park actually that came later um, you know, you can see the difference in, 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 in the desire to sort of spread out and, and, and have a more suburban, leafy green garden existence. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to think, honestly, beyond La Ville Radieuse in a way, because it's so instrumental and like deeply ingrained in, in the ideology of, of like basic health provisions. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it's worth re reconsidering, I guess. I would love to see an evolution of, of La Vila Radios that's sort of, I don't know, more um, integrated and less isolating. 
um, but still as much uh, a response to health provisions. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, maybe we could take a follow-up after. We, we have a, another question by Vikas Chan Sharma, which I, I'm afraid I can't, can't fully understand. I asked you to clarify, but I haven't gotten it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to interpret it and maybe reflect on it and then, and then hand it off to you, Daniel. But the question is, what's the prediction for adding aesthetics in the city and, and for prolonging aesthetics? So I, I'm not quite sure exactly what, uh, because you mean here, but how I'm gonna choose to interpret that question because unfortunately communication isn't as direct as it could be as uh, could be if you're in person. Is it something that I think that I was struck by and I think a lot of a lot of uh, the audience may have been struck by was you know the, the beauty which you pointed out the beauty of the representation of, of, of data and the city right uh, and the aesthetics of representing data which of course is the kind of um, the fuel for rationalization as, a, as an undergirding value or principle. Um, and today in The Guardian, there was this fascinating article about how some of the major papers on COVID-19 uh, relief kind of medication, potential medications uh, are based on basically potentially entirely faulty or fraudulent data, potentially, mm -hmm. right? So trace this data back to some company who is run, which is run by some science fiction author and a kind of adult uh, actor uh, who somehow has provided all the data with a kind of global database with kind of 100 LinkedIn followers for these major papers on, on the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine that have become the basis for major policy decisions um, all over the world. So this, of course, raises another dimension to the aesthetics of the invisible, which is invisible data um, and, and how that potentially threatens the, let's say, the kind of the um, the space where rationalization is deemed most appropriate or empirical, i.e. medicine, right? So what happens when we can't even visualize that data? How has representation of data changed? Uh, should that be something we consider going forward? Yeah, that, that's a, the interesting conclusion of, of uh, Beatrice Colomina's book. Um, she makes this implication um, that she doesn't quite go into because it's outside the scope of the book, um, but she sort of implies like what new technologies of, of representation are necessary um, in the way that the x-ray was necessary for, um, for conceiving of how we structure and manage and, and, and understand the, the built environment. Um, and one of the things that's implied is that the idea that there's too much data um, and that it's hard to actually sift through all the information we're producing um, I mean, Foucault's uh, classic um, um, sort of uh, paradigm that he sets up in, in The Birth of the Clinic is, is the association between power and knowledge, um, right? It's like power knowledge, like one kind of word. Um, but now it's, it's almost like you need to wield that power in a specific way. And yeah, aesthetics can definitely do that. Um, I think... I mean, that, that's why I mentioned the idea of risk and uncertainty, because um, obviously your calculation of risk is, is based on the information and the, and the data that you have. Um, and that can be both top down and bottom up, much like you said um, in regards to the smart city. Um, the smart city, like the technologies you have for accessing information, uh, you know, it can be a sort of emancipatory tool or being able to communicate between people or being able to um, access things in the city that you normally wouldn't have access to. Even if it's as simple as, as like, you know, the traffic down the street. Um, versus the, the other option for the smart city, which is a, a top down use of technology where it's like, you know, you're being spied on essentially. Um, and both of these things are, are happening at, at once. Um, but, yeah, I think I think power, knowledge, um, and I guess I mean I guess there's some space for organization, um, and yeah, I mean I mean that's a good point to reinforce the fact that that aesthetics are not um, neutral at all. Uh, are, are they're never neutral? Um, they're always embedded with with politics, uh, with uh, historical politics, and with um, ongoing politics. Um, there's always some sort of system they tap into. 
And in my own artwork, what I'm trying to create are these are these situations um, which allow you to sort of consider the grander um, uh, scheme of things, but that uh, that that coalesce the sort of political moment around both an object and a subject, but also from from um, uh, you know subject to subject and also object to object in a way if that makes sense like using the sort of public um, interactions with an object to create a sense of of publicness um, and and doing so by filtering it through an, an interpretable um, moment I mean I often use the word situation for lack of a better word but I'm I'm um, I'm uh, uh, hesitant to compare myself to the greats. <laughs> okay, interesting. If How are we doing now, John? Time. What yeah, should we? If I, um, I wonder if that questions by because may be um, to do with the the new normal, the two meter apart that you mentioned, as if it it will who it be, well, how it would be maintained long term. Oh, in terms, in terms is, of the actual policy. Yeah. Kind of like, what yeah, would like be the new aesthetics of the city? What would be the new? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with sneeze guards right now. Uh, there's some like acrylic manufacturer somewhere who's making a killing. Um, also, just in like the supermarkets and the bodegas in my neighborhood before they were all smashed, um, they had like a kind of wonderfully wonderful range of 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 like dividers between things. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know if the, if like the aesthetics will be so physical or if it'll result in a kind of change in, in social aesthetics in how we view um, or how we manifest our social intentions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there's gonna be, you know, like as we keep distance from each other, uh, more of a resurgence of an effort to try to create um, um, a context where we can um, participate in society equally. Um, not equally, but even just, um, you know, um, forcefully or meaningfully. Um, equality, obviously, is, is um, valuable as well. Um, but uh, judging by what we've seen um there have been some interesting and bizarre kind of surreal moments of people protesting six feet apart um uh, notably against uh, netanyahu in israel and and some instances uh, in the u.s um but um i mean for the most part the the sort of social protests we're seeing are are taken at at the risk of of the pandemic um which could make them even more powerful somehow um and somewhat more concerning at the same time um so um how do we how do we keep that going forward uh, i mean the sad fact of, of 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 the matter is is that this virus is almost more than likely a kind of practice run for um or other pandemics that will uh, um, spread as a result of um, growing populations and um, uh, our continued interactions with animals. Um, we are also spreading disease to animals, by the way. We've given elephants, captive elephants, cholera. Uh, sorry, not cholera, um, tuberculosis. Um, almost all zoos and circuses that have elephants uh, have, have um, elephant tuberculosis, that's a reverse um, uh, zoonotic disease. Um, so in all likelihood, we'll, we'll have um, more conditions such as these in the future. Uh, already, um, um, the coronavirus was actually a bit of a surprise because everyone expected an, influ uh, an influenza to be the sort of biggest threat for an outbreak. Um, by everyone, I mean like the, the um, community of um, epidemiologists. Um, so, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if 
if the top-down approach, if the codification into law of these kind of um, uh, environmental like prostheses required to separate people is um, is as interesting as the kind of um, inhabitations that people have concocted in order to um, find space within this newly kind of divided, um, divided um, like milieu we find ourselves in. Um, I think that would be my answer is that um, it's kind of a, a non-answer, but it's... Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's okay. That's mm -hmm. fascinating. I mean, maybe we can move this quickly into another domain, which is, I think, relates to the next three questions. So maybe in the interest of also time, we can kind of, I can wrap them together, which is um, the question of, of, again, digital technology and the medium through which we are reporting and we are communicating, as well as vulnerability, the theme of vulnerability as a as a, as a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ancient category for, for understanding society. So uh, Bezos Alebi, a student of mine uh, in the MPhil and Architecture and Urban Studies asks uh, if, 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 if vulnerability of the body ha has, are we more vulnerable today? If you think we are more vulnerable today in the broadest meaning of the sense um, of the word, um, given kind of functionalist social systems and, and neoliberalism. Um, Jean Meunier, uh, replies with which he's surprised that we have not included more discussion of the means of, of communication we're using at the very very moment I how cyberspace is involved so perhaps there's a link between notions of vulnerability in cyberspace and and James Poxton a teacher in the MPhil in architecture and urban design is interested in data and he is curious about um, how self-reporting uh, again I, I think something to, uh, related to vulnerability and 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 uh, the digital, is seen to be contributing to a solution to a kind of battle against the disease. So becoming a data point on a daily basis. He asks, he would be interested to have your view from cholera to COVID, whether the agency of data and its collection have changed. So there's this question of the media, the medium uh, through which we communicate and relate data, the question of vulnerability and whether the medium the virtual, the cyber, the invisibility of the data that we're currently using, the fact that we cannot register a round of applause or something like that, whether that um, somehow invokes or propels a uh, heightened vulnerability, perhaps what the aesthetics of that vulnerability are. Um, I mean, to me, the, the vulnerability is, is the, the, let's say, essential workers who are not able to digitize. Um, and uh, you can see the, the class and especially the race dimensions, uh, especially in the US, the, the racial dimensions of that, um, which, are, which are not new. The um, inequalities and disparities of health are, are, are not new. COVID just made it worse. Um, but in terms of uh, the communication of ideas, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Uh, a lot of these, um, a lot of these ideas were kind of lobbied through uh, journals and magazines that were um, that built up their reputations through um, actually conducting uh, um, like experiments on the ground. Um, cholera was described when cholera broke out in Paris. It was described as um, the hygienist's new laboratory because they could actually go out and test their ideas. Um, in the city, and then that information was later sort of codified into the the bureaus and the organization of the government. Um, and a lot of what Hausman gets credit for is actually um, ideas that were put forward by the by the hygienists, um, who were you know a kind of ragtag group of of people who were interested in social reform, um, who had medical training, and who um, and who earned their reputation. Um, that is very, very different from sort of Facebook rumors. Um, at the same time, like rumors aren't new and, and misinformation isn't new either. Like I mentioned, for instance, the, the riot in, in, um, in uh, Liverpool where um, there was a sort of fear of, of, uh, of body snatchers 
um, which led to a sort of heightened hysteria. And eventually um, they killed a bunch of um, um, dock workers who were um, loading a body to go somewhere, like a corpse, um, but hadn't snatched it. There was some sort of, I don't know, accident or something. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there, there is a need for, I guess, more reinforcement of, of expertise, um, which is, which is, I mean, which is a dangerous thing to say in a way, right? Because um, the sort of top-down approach of being told what to do is is, is quite dangerous, but. Um, I don't know. It's it's very surprising. I mean, got the 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 modern concept of government of this idea of a bureaucratized body of people who basically know what they're talking about and can manage resources and whatnot. Um, that was basically invented as a response to epidemic disease. Um, and to have um, first of all um, uh, the wrong kind of information getting into um, Let's say like expert experts or managers' hands. Um, uh, too much access to information to the point where it's violating uh, other civil rights, um, as well as uh, incompetent governments. Um, all of these things to me seem interrelated and um, and actually fundamentally hygienic problems. Okay. Um, so. It's just not to, can you get a time check another five more minutes or something like that? Or, sorry, your mic's off. Sorry, oh, your sorry mic's I was mute. <laughs> um, I think we can wrap up a lot here and then the questions that haven't been answered, I can forward it to you in your email. If that's okay. okay. Yeah. All right, so. I have uh, to plug my own email if anyone wants to uh, send well, me uh, questions, which is just info at danieliot.com. That's great, especially because, you know, I think we have a, 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 um, a, a wonderfully mixed audience of theorists and practitioners. And my next question would have been about, um, you know, your approach to being so bifocal, right, to combine practice and then moving back and forth and, and how that happens um, in your practice. But I, we'll leave that to um, future conversations and to, um, to emails um, or further, further, further kind of talks perhaps one day in Cambridge again. But in, in just to wrap up, maybe, you know, we've, we're seeing right now just to bring again the kind of the, the confluence of so the pandemics and so-called social problems together. We're seeing on the one hand racism being framed explicitly by activists as a kind of pandemic, um, as a kind of psychological pandemic. And then we're also a mental health issue really by, by many. And then we're also seeing people upset at activists um, blaming the explosion, future explosion of the pandemic on them. So, you know, we see a lot of circulation of these ideas that Daniel has been so, we've been so grateful to have Daniel kind of illuminate and try to shed some light on. So I encourage everyone to uh, track the discourse, track the aesthetics and the representation of, of the confluence of these things and, and to see if the undergirding values are changing, uh, if color was so fundamental to our idea of government, what will COVID do? So thank you so much, Daniel, um, for that really thought-provoking, uh, provocative uh, jump between theory and practice and back. It's so um, pertinent to our, our very complex, potentially full of possibility uh, present moment. So um, yeah, I think- yeah, I mean, Thank you, Daniel, for, for being here. And yeah, also thank, thank you for me. having me. And um, I'm really looking forward to hopefully continuing these conversations in some means if anyone wants to get in touch. Okay, thank you very much. And also thank you, Nick, for introducing us to Daniel or introducing Daniel to us. Um, thank you so much for your time today. And I will be back again next week for the last lecture with Chot Sutters, who is a Dutch architect. So same time, same format. And then thank you again for joining us. Today. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Daniel.